Okay, we're going to. It's been it's been a night already. Um, uh, call this meeting to order, and we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'll please join me. Okay, so um, before we start our meeting, we just wanted to um, give a, a recognition for the very uh, tragic events that occurred at Michigan State University yesterday. And uh, we have uh, many families in Cherry Hill who have ties to that university as well as the state. And um, it's always tragic when we see um, a tragedy like that happen on a college campus or any educational campus. So we just like to take a moment of silence and recognition of, of those families and their loved ones. I'm wishing all the people who are touched by that tragedy, peace and healing. Okay, so happy Valentine's Day. Thank you for joining us on this day of connection and love. Um, maybe, maybe that's what it is. Okay. Mrs. Sugars, if you could please have the roll call. Mrs. Stratton. Here. Mrs. Fleischer. Mrs. Gallagher. Here. Mr. Greenbaum. Here. Mr. Mayor. Here. Dr. Rude. Here. Mrs. Tong. Here. Mrs. Winters. Here. Ms. Stern. Here. Okay, um, tonight we do not have any board recognition, uh, nor do we have any presentations. And Dr. Malash, do no administrative report, uh, reports. So we're going to go directly to uh, correspondence. Do any board members have any correspondence they'd like to share? Mrs. Gallagher. <clears throat> um, I, wrote, I wrote this so I didn't mess up. So, um, I guess it was the first weekend in February, Mr. Greenbaum and I participated in Governance One training. It's a fun weekend up in Princeton. Um, we learned a lot about board basic functions um, and it was extremely beneficial as we got to meet about a hundred other new board members from around New Jersey. Um, we also got to meet some very experienced board members who led small groups and really helped us dive deeper into many topics. Um, this was their first weekend back in person since COVID. So um, I could tell that the staff was like really excited to be back in person training. Um, it was long, but <laughs> it was really beneficial. And I'll say that it was nice to spend the weekend with Mr. Greenbaum to get to know each other better as a board member and just as as uh, colleagues. And it was a, it was really nice to meet other board members from around the state to kind of hear about what's going on in, in their districts and and just kind of hear similarities and differences and and go from there. So thank you. Great, thank you, Mrs. Um, uh, Elmar Stratton. Yes, uh, this past week I was able to listen in on the Zone PTA meeting. Uh, just literally just as a listening ear to to hear all the, the great things that they're doing. So just wanted to give them a special shout out for all of the the work, the hard work they're doing in each one of the schools and, and all the members that take their time to be a part of uh, of that committee and that that whole uh, setup of the system. So it was it was really informational and uh, I hope to try to listen in again. That's great. Great. Other board members have correspondence? Uh, Mrs. Winters. On Wednesday, the Legislature's Joint Committee on the Public Schools held a hearing on early childhood education and preschool. Um, it was a virtual meeting, so it was easy to attend. So I attended the meeting and got some really good information and feedback that I brought back to share with the members of Curriculum Instruction Committee and the administrators who are working on it. That's great. Thank you. Other correspondence? Mr. Mayor. Um, last night, I had a, a chance, um, along with uh, Dr. Malash, to attend the East-West Boys basketball game at Cherry Hill West. 
just wonderful opportunity to see school spirit and school competition between East and West where it belongs. Um, both uh, both sidelines, um, especially student sections from East and West, brought their best, um, and it was really wonderful to see. Um, that's where that's where we want the the uh, competition to stay on the court, on the fields, and um, and it was there, and it was it was great. All school spirit was was amazing on both sides. Also had an opportunity to uh, attend along with um, Mrs. Stern and Dr. Malash uh, the Barton PTA meeting last um, last week. Um, and I'll, I'll leave to uh, to them some additional comments they may have. But for me, it was just a great opportunity um, to have a real, um, real-time feedback opportunity to um, feel some questions um, and give some responses and, and hear uh, from the parents at the school. You know, some issues, a lot of stuff that they love. It's great to hear some, some uh, questions that they had, some some uh, things that they just needed to learn a little more about, and to have an opportunity to engage um, and educate was was great. Uh, we thank uh, the PTA at Barton for hosting us. I uh, look forward to hopefully attending some more of the school PTA meetings as well, because it was a it was just a really good format um, for us to engage the community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, other correspondence from. We don't have too many people left. So. <laughs> Any other board member correspondence? All right, so I'll take my turn. Um, I'll just kind of piggyback on um, the Barton PTA meeting. Um, the And a shameless plug for any other PTAs out there that would like us to attend. We're very excited and happy to come and attend a meeting, um, kind of a more open forum for questions um, and discussion, which, um, as I said in that meeting, um, I know what it's like to sit in the audience of a board meeting, and it's generally very unsatisfying um, to sit and, and have to listen and make a public comment and get no response because that's the format of our meeting. These are our meetings where we work. So um, it was nice to have a very different type of format. So um, encourage the PTAs to invite us and we'll show up. And um, the three of us were there and um, uh, there was a, a two hours of discussion, actually. Um, we uh, The Barton PTA was uh, kind enough to send us a, a, a great long list of questions ahead of time and had more chance to um, answer those questions um, and also have more of a dialogue. Um, anything from discussion about the bond work that was being done um, to questions about middle school redistricting to discussions about lunches um, and uh, all, all kinds of great questions. So um, board members, uh, you guys got a bit of a summary from us about that, um, but uh, it was really, I think, a just uh, a, a great, much more um, interactive um, opportunity than I think we normally have as a board. So I'm looking forward to us uh, doing more of that and different combinations of board members attending this. So um, happy about that. Uh, going on my list here. So uh, Mrs. Winters and I, have we we met? Do we meet about the okay? <laughs> The robot, the robotic. Did we did we mention that? We mentioned that last time. I am I'm having trouble keeping track. Okay, I don't need to talk about that. So, um, uh, Mrs. Fleischer and I, who's not here tonight, um, uh, we were at the road forward, the last road forward meeting, which um, we will be um, uh, having addressed in our um, in our agenda tonight. That um, because of the changes at the state level, um, there are no there's no longer a need for the road forward committee to be meeting. So we had our last meeting. But, what was nice to, to finish that. Um, I got a chance to attend the production of Puffs, Seven Increasingly Eventful Years at a Certain School of Magic and Magic, Two Acts for Young Wizards at West on February 4th. I think it was 15 degrees outside, but it was warm in the theater. Uh, Dr. Malash was there and uh, we were both in lined pants that night. If I if I could share that, disclose that personal piece of information that we will layer, both layered up a lot separately, but we ended up there both wearing lined pants. So it was a great production. The kids did a fantastic job. It was a small cast, um, but really a bit of a Harry Potter uh, takeoff. So a great production. Uh, congratulations to the theater, uh, amazing theater program at West. Um, I got a chance to attend the girls basketball uh, East versus West varsity basketball game on the sixth, which was also fantastic. It's actually the first time I've I've gotten to see my um I see a lot of boys basketball games just because of the nature of my family, but um it's my first time watching a girls high school basketball game. 
definitely a different um, experience from the boys. And I wish it had been better attended, to be honest with you, um, because the boys basketball game, I came in at the tail end of yesterday's game to come watch the JV game and the boys, it was packed. Um, Not so much for the girls, but there were definitely supporters there. It was just nice to see that. And then also to see the cheerleaders um, at at the girls game, since it was hosted at East, it was girls, uh, the girls cheerleaders from East. So that was, that was great to see them just kids giving it their all and, and enjoying themselves out there in a different way connected to our schools. Um, and then the last thing I was able to be part of was um, I was invited. I think it was the invitation came the morning after I was uh, of uh, became president of the board of ed from uh, the, the um, it's called the uh, Huaxia um, Chinese school, which uh, takes place uh, and in our building space, they rent our building space um, at Beck, and they host a Chinese school, Chinese language school and culture, and they had a an annual gala um, honoring the year of the rabbit, and I got a chance to be there and um, have a couple minutes on stage, um, got a chance to practice my Chinese a little bit, and um, and the mayor gave a proclamation there, which was also wonderful um, in honor of our, our families that um, are part of that, so that was pretty neat. That happened this past Sunday, so I think that's it. Okay, and no other correspondence? Okay. So we will now move on to first public comment. There will be two opportunities for public comment this evening. The first public comment session is for board action items only, items 17 through 19. There will be another public comment section for any topic at the end of the meeting. If you are a student in the district, you may comment on any agenda item during the first public comment period or any other item at all. It is our tradition. We um, we um, always want to give students the chance to speak out um, early in our meeting. So um, if you are a student and you're uh, calling in online, please identify yourself with an S at the name at the end of your name so we know you're a student. Um, and uh, if you'd like to speak now, again, we're going to ask the students to approach the podium first. Um, and raise your hands online first. If you would like to speak now, please identify the agenda item and clearly state your name and municipality. We will alternate between speakers here in the room and those that are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. The timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. Cherry Hill is a community that values education and educational topics often bring out a passionate response. The Cherry Hill Board of Education supports a school climate in which our diversity is a source of strength and all are included. uh, Respect is foundational in how we treat you, how we treat one another, and how we support our administration and staff in their essential work. Please join us in practicing the utmost respect for all. Okay, and with that, we will start with in the room. So if there are any students who would like to approach the podium. Okay, and if you will just say your name and your municipality, please. Name's Jack Neary. Live here in Cherry Hill, of course. I wanted to um, I wanted to highlight and speak about something that is quite personal to me. During my time in both high schools, I've been able to truly see the reason why parents and students care so much about the high school, middle school they will attend. There is a difference. As I've seen both, there is quite the difference. When it comes to clubs, there is a plethitude at a different at the other. There is. Mm, The amount of running clubs is double what you can see out the other. I've only seen better experience there, and it saddens me, as your high school experience shouldn't be based off of a golden ticket. Problems of these this magnitude is the reason why people have been speaking out so much and caring about the whole redistricting when it comes to what middle school, what high school. It shouldn't have to matter to them. And I, I see why, because there is most certainly a difference, and problems like these don't start in the matter of days. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will go on the line. Let me just see if we have anybody. Nobody, thank you for helping me out. Okay, Um, don't see any hands on the line yet. So we'll go back to the room if we have a student. Okay, and if you would just kindly say your name and your municipality. Lila Neary, Cherry Hill. You said that we could stay at our schools because we are the last year of the lottery. That should apply to everyone. Why is it that regular class kids will get to choose and that is it? That, but you said that if you have an IEP like I do, I don't for sure get the choice. 
I have to wait and see what is decided by grownups at my IEP meeting. That is not fair. You give some kids a real choice, but not kids with IEPs. It's not easy for kids like me to make friends or connect with my teachers. And if I can't stay at my school, it will be really hard to start over. Please keep your promises to all kids. Us kids with IEPs are already treated differently enough. And to treat us differently by not letting us choose because we have an IEP is not fair. You can't say one thing and then change it after it's decided. Thank you and happy Valentine's Day. Thank you, Lila. Okay, I'm looking back on the line. I don't see any hands on the line uh, and um, go back to the room to see if there are any other students who would like to speak before we move on to adults. Wow, it's really a different kind of a night. We even have music in the background. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I don't see any other children at the podium. Kids, if you change your mind and you want to come up, you're welcome to come back up again. I don't see any hands on the line of any kids either. So now we will open it up to um, any adults who would like to make a public comment on our, our um, items on our action agenda. So if you could come to the podium. Don't see any on the podium. Uh, Someone's approaching. Don't see any hands online, so come quick <laughs> before we stop. <laughs> um, I don't have it open yet, and I apologize. It's for HR and appointments. So I think that's usually point one for whatever that section is. <laughs> Been here on two way too many times. So Yoni Iris Cherry Hill. Just wanted to acknowledge and say we're really excited to welcome Mr. Santo to Crimp uh, Kilmer. Um, several of us did our what we parents do best, and what our students do as well. We looked them up uh, online. Uh, and sounds just looks like an absolute amazing fit. And we're super excited for him to spend the next couple of months with us and be there for whatever transitions next. Um, so just really want to say that we're all excited. The PTA president would have been here, but we were all getting sick right now, the uh, parents and kids included. So just want to say they're really excited and thank you for the process. And it's great that how quickly that posting got filled um, with everything going on. Um, that's not easy to do. There are shortages across the board. So just want to say thanks. We're really excited. Thank you. That was 19.3 the item. Okay. Uh, we will look online one more time. No hands raised, so I don't see any. Um, did I? Nope. And I'll look back in the room one last time, last time for kids. Okay. Okay. So we will um, close public comment one and move on to our agenda and to our board work session. So now we are going to start with um, curriculum instruction and um, uh, Mrs. Winters, if you would kindly um, move. <laughs> sure. Go to Mrs. We can go to Mrs. Winters, please, to please give your committee report. Happy to. So curriculum instruction met on Monday, February 6th. Um, it was a long, but I think really productive meeting. Um, we had a presentation from Mr. Guy, who's the principal of Rosa Middle School, who came to talk to us about the end of the IB MYP program at Rosa. Um, that program was put in place in 1999 when Rosa was opened as a magnet school. Rosa will no longer be a magnet school anymore. And Mr. Guy really felt that the best parts of the IB MYP program had been integrated into Rosa successfully. They learned a lot from it. But at this point, um, continuing with it, especially because it's quite expensive, didn't really make a lot of sense with the new middle school configuration we're going towards. Um, one thing the committee was really happy to hear was that the service learning aspect, which a lot of us who have kids at Rosa really love, is going to be brought forward to the middle school committee that's meeting and talked about maybe expanding it to all three middle schools. Beck and Carusi, too, will be bringing the best parts of their school to that committee as well. So I'm really excited to see some of the best parts of each middle school duplicated and replicated across the district so that all students can access them. I think it's really going to be a plus for our kids. Um, so we appreciated that. After that, we had the majority of our meeting was an achievement discussion, um, which was presented to us by Ms. Allison Staffen, who's a supervisor in the CNI office. Um, the committee has been working really hard towards defining how um, achievement is looked at in our district, thinking about the standards that we get from the state, thinking about the methods of um, instruction and evaluation for those standards. And Ms. Staffen was phenomenal. She really went through at a very granular level, 
how the state standards connect to what's taught in our classrooms, connect to the evaluations, both state evaluations and district level evaluations, and how we take that feedback and put it back into uh, modifying things so that the instruction is the very best for our students that it can be. I, I thought as committee chair that it was really phenomenal. Um, the committee learned a lot and we're gonna take from that conversation and then move forward as we seek to really think about um, both the strengths that we have right now, and there are a ton of them, and also the ways that we can improve because we're constantly improving, um, and how can we target resources towards where they need to be targeted and then to continue to get our kids to where they need to be and where we know that they can be. So that will be the continuing work of the committee as the year goes forward. Um, the other things the committee did, we had a very brief update on preschool expansion, which as everybody knows is my favorite thing. Um, discussions continue about preschool expansion. Um, for our district, we are hoping to apply for the preschool expansion program this fall. Um, and moving towards that goal, conversations have been had with community providers in the district who provide preschool because the state's model is both in district and community provider classrooms for preschool. So that's something that's going on and we're continuing to discuss what the best way um, to move forward with implementation is. It is a five-year implementation process. It's not something that's gonna happen wholesale this coming fall, but it's something that we'll need a plan for to move forward. And the target would be, the state's target is that after five years, you're serving 90% of the universe of three and four-year-olds in the district, which would be crazy when you think about it. It's like adding two more grade levels to the district. Um, but we're an ambitious bunch and <laughs> I think we can do it. So we're working on it hard. Um, the other things that we talked about were a policy that's on first reading tonight about bilingual and ESL education. And something I'm super excited about is abolishing things that we don't need anymore, including um, the road forward COVID-19 policy, which I don't think anybody is very sad to see go. Um, excuse me, and a school employee vaccination policy. Um, and then we did take some public comment as well, which I always like to do. So that was the meeting. Thanks so much. Do any other committee members have anything that they want to say? Sorry. I'm still new with this. Ms. Stern. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could um, share with us um, the anticipated number of preschool students we would need to serve with, with the universe, as it's called, um, about how many ultimately could that end up being as we see it now. So the state asks you to calculate your number of preschoolers by doubling the number of first graders that you have. So you take your first grade universe and you double it and that's how you estimate. So that would be about, and Dr. Mahan, you can correct me if I get this wrong. It's about 1700 kids, um, which is a lot of preschoolers, but you know, they're tiny. So we'll fit them in somewhere. I have lots of confidence in us. Um, there are a lot of requirements for preschool, one of them being that the class size is 15 students with a certified P3 teacher and an aide. Um, and there's also requirements as to how big the classrooms have to be, physically be, um, and bathroom locations. So there's a lot of requirements when it comes to how you, how you conceptualize and think about preschool, but we are not the first school to do preschool expansion. Um, about a third of the preschoolers in New Jersey are currently being served by public preschool. I mean, it's not all of them, but it's there's a big chunk. Some of them have been getting public preschool for almost, well, over 20 years now. The Abbott preschool program started, which is impossible because there's no way I could have been in college 20 years ago, but there you have it. The Abbott preschool program started about 20 years ago, and those kids are actually um, in college now, but there's data that track them from preschool through grade 10 and show the extreme benefits of the program um, that we're basically trying to duplicate here in Cherry Hill. So it, it is a big universe of kids and it's a huge project, but I think if we can get it right, it'll be a hugely impactful project as well. Um, can you explain the 90% again? Why 90%? So that's the state's target. States. Um, I don't know if that's actually super realistic. When I watched the joint committee, which is the legislature's joint committee on the public schools meeting, some of the experts from Rutgers that testified thought more realistic would be between 70 and 90 percent. But the state is asking us to plan to serve that target. Now, I would imagine that there will be some people who would not want to opt. I mean, because preschool is voluntary, right? It's not like, you know, once you get into first grade, first grade is, you know, it's different, but for preschool, you, you know, it's a voluntary program. So you would think that a lot of people would be enticed by free 
full day preschool for their three and four year olds, but some people may wish not to opt in. Some people may want um, a different kind of preschool experience, maybe a religious school. Some people will opt to keep their kids home and in family care. Um, but it would be something that would then be offered to all the threes and fours in the district. And the hope, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, Dr. Mahan, because you're the expert, but the hope would be, my personal hope, I'll do this, <laughs> is that um, we see we see so much benefit from full day kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I'm so incredibly proud of what that is. And I have a full day kindergartner right now um, who I see benefiting from it. And I would love to see the growth that we could have if we could, if kids opted into preschool at three and four and we got them ready for that kindergarten experience, mm -hmm. um, how great it could really be for them. And I think you can see, and I have you know data on this if you'd like to see it, Ms. Gallagher, the trajectory of how the benefit of their access to high quality early child education benefits them going forward. Oh no, for sure. I agree. Um, and then one more question. I think if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, Collingswood implemented kinder or pre uh, pre-k or I'm sorry, preschool. As the district considers moving forward, do we see ourselves maybe reaching out to some of these local districts to see how they like best practices. And Dr. Mahan has already been doing that work. Um, I know she's visited several districts. We did it with kindergarten too. Dr. Okay. Mahan, do you want to talk about? She does not. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the very first things that we did. We always collaborate with other districts who are participating in projects that we want to participate in. Not only have we been in contact with Collingswood, we've been in contact with Voorhees, who also has the program, along with Vineland, who's one of the oldest preschool programs in the state. Um, we have several contacts um, in Galloway Township as well. So we have been traveling all over to see not only their application process, but also their facilities. And if they are working with mixed use providers, licensed providers in the community, what that relationship looks like and also visiting offsite providers. Do any other CNI committee members have things to say? Ms. Elmore Stratton. Um, just real quick, I, I, I want to again share that, that we did spend a bulk of the time up talking about uh, achievement and sort of portrait of graduate, sort of just definition of proficiency, definition of uh, readiness to move beyond our community for the school. And I think the presentation was really done by Mrs. Staff and it, it really dove uh, into it. Um, and I had a, a couple aha moments during the, the committee meeting as well. And um, it was just really good to have her break down how we are working in collaboration and inquiry across the board. So just wanted to add that. I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And um, we will move on to business and facilities. Mr. Mayor, if you could kindly give the report. Happily. Um, I'll keep this brief. Uh, we, we handled a, a handful of conversations last week at, at our meeting. First was a discussion about um, revisions that will be necessary to a policy, the policy which um, speaks to the manner in which board members are elected at the re reorg meeting for uh, for leadership. Um, there are two options that are, are presented. One is whether to uh, whether the election should be by the majority of the members who are actually present at the reorg meeting. And the second option is whether it should be by a majority of the board, regardless of how many are actually present at that meeting. Um, we discussed that and uh, came to a consensus uh, among members that option one, the the um, using that option of the majority of the members present was the most, seemed to be the most practical of the two. Um, after I com complete the rest of my updates, we, we can have a discussion about that um, because you know, that, we're, that, that ultimately is um, what the recommendation of the committee is, but we would like to get everyone else's input. Uh, and then, and we'll explain uh, why we made that uh, recommendation as well. We moved on then to discuss uh, the need to issue an RFP, um, which, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's it's out, correct, Ms. Sugars, uh, for um, the con our construction management services. Right now, New Road Construction is our construction manager. Um, they've done a, a fantastic job for us. Um, we certainly expect that they are going to respond to the RFP. They'll and, and there will be. They won't be the only only bidder. Um, we're going to have to award that contract uh, late March. Um, the current contract ends in June. 
So that's moving along very well. Very good news with regards to our um, state annual audit. Um, it was delayed just a little bit because the state had not supplied necessary uh, pension data. Normally that's done about a month or so earlier, but they were late in getting that in. That has now happened. Um, there are no findings, no recommendations. Um, and that's another year of, of excellent, uh, excellent work on the part of um, the business office, Ms. Sugars and, and her staff. Um, we expect that within the next two or three months or so, we'll have um, someone from our auditing team come in and, and, and speak and give some details on that. But uh, it's great. It's, uh, it's always good to get that kind of good news. Um, and uh, moving on from there, the, the budget is almost complete. Again, there were some delays in getting some of that information in from the state, but that has now finally come in. Um, so we'll be in a position to finalize our budget um, and present that with, with details um, quite soon. In fact, might be our, is it our next action meeting? Or maybe the, maybe it might be the one after that. Yeah, we'll be um, presenting some information at the end of the month, and then it'll be our first meeting in March that we will need to actually approve our initial submission budget. Uh, but all the data is in. Um, it's just a matter now of, of cross-checking all that data, making uh, making sure everything is accurate. There was some detail presented, and this is also good news with respect to where we stand with um, bus routes and going out for bids um, for transportation. Um, significantly more of our routes were um, renewed by the companies that we currently have, which meant that we did not need to put out as many bids as as, may, as we had the year before. Um, that's all good news. All those bids are out. There is absolutely uh, complete confidence um, that all of the routes will be filled. So all the transportation needs for all of our students to get to all of the schools. Uh, we're not going to have any any issues or, um, with that whatsoever. Um, and last two items, uh, we we discussed um, a project. It's called a project labor agreement, which is going to be in place for our bond work. The project labor agreement will cover only those projects which are at a um, total cost of five million dollars or more per project, and that will assure consistency um, with regards to the manner in which uh, the uh, the laborers who are working on those contracts are treated or treated by um, by their management uh, and all of their expectations. We had a robust discussion about that. It was well explained and and. Uh, we will have the date that has been, it has already been executed, or when is that coming up for execution? Tonight. Yeah, okay, <laughs> there we go. Um, so um, that was, um, it's good to know that we're going to have that in place. Again, it's only for the larger projects, so it's $5 million or more, um, and all other projects, there will be many, many projects throughout the course of all of the bond work that will be smaller projects of less than $5 million. So there will be plenty of opportunity for smaller groups, smaller construction uh, firms to, to be involved and, and do great work for us in the district. Last, um, last issue that we talked about was uh, just touched upon um, some, some concerns that came up um, through the community and also a uh, board member with regards to some of the options which are being offered for breakfasts by, by Aramark um, and that we wanted to learn a little bit more about um, what those options are and whether there might be an opportunity for Aramark to present um, healthier options for breakfast. We, uh, understanding how important that particular meal is um, for students and their ability to concentrate throughout the course of the day. Uh, also, you know, for, for those that should be and, and are always more, more health conscious, what we learned briefly was um, that those options that are currently available don't always, for instance, the Pop-Tarts, um, that are that are offered by our mark are not pop tarts. They're not the pop tarts that you see in in Wegmans or Shoprite um, because they have to meet very strict federal guidelines with respect to sugar content, protein content, uh, and and overall nutritional value. So while it may look like it is the um, less than healthy option, it's actually a much healthier than one that that we might buy otherwise. That said, um, we're going to continue our conversations with Aramark uh, and and ask. But they normally do present uh, once to us, or maybe even often more more often than that during the year, 
Um, so we can explore with them the options and also have them explain to us in a little more detail um, what those options actually are. Um, and, and that'll be you know, a good opportunity for us to learn more about it and, then, and, and to talk about you know, maybe possibly some changes in the future. Um, yeah, and that was it. Any other comments from, uh, from committee members from last week's meeting? Any questions? Yes. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, highlight for board members. So last year when um, I was involved with BNF, um, the, which I think you saw this in your notes, the consumer price index increase was very low. That was the state sets that. And as a result, we have a, we had a, a less than 50% um, of rebids from our busing company back last year, which then put us in a very difficult position to have to put all, I'm sorry, not rebid, to renew their contract. So, you know, we had to bid out those. those and, and as we've seen, as we've approved over time, you know, we need to make sure we have buses to transport our students. We've ended up approving, you know, bids that were, you know, perhaps more than we wanted to have to deal with in our own budget. Um, and because busing is the largest part of our budget um, outside of, uh, in our fixed costs, outside of our, you know, personnel and, and benefits, um, you know, for me, it was a great relief to see that we have 80% of our routes renewed. However, <laughs> they're at the consumer price index increase, which is over 5%. So I, you know, I just think like when we think about operational costs of of everything, um, you know, it's significant when that's our largest fixed cost expense. So um, since we have a relatively newer board <laughs> at the table with us, I just like wanted to share my 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 one year history experience with that. So, um, but uh, that's the main thing. I just I really wanted to say to folks, and yeah, I appreciate that. Okay, we will now move on to uh, Mrs. Elmore Stratton to please um, give the committee report from Human Resources, as limited as that might be. <laughs> sure. Uh, so the only two items I can share, um, we did uh, discuss approval of job description, job description, um, reviewing the job description for Director of HR, um, and we'll begin that search. Will start soon. And then the ongoing conversation of recruitment and us having uh, several open positions that need to be filled, some that just opened in January. And so our recruitment needs to be very heavy at this time. So as always, my shameless plug in public is please, please share and tell people to come here or take a look at us uh, because we, we definitely are ready to expand our admin teaching support staff family all around the district. So thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, questions? I'm like on that, I have two things. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Mrs. Fleischer, who is the chair of a policy and legislation is unfortunately not here with us tonight. So I'm going going to ask uh, Mrs. Winters to please give the report for PNL. Sure, so PNL also met on February 6th. Um, the first thing that happened was we discussed, um, for in informational purposes only, policy 5770, which is student right of privacy. Um, the committee received some proposed language and had a bunch of questions and feedback, which we submitted through Ms. Weddington um, to be given to Mr. Green for his review on um, administrative discussion. And I that policy will probably be coming back to the committee, um, but no action was taken at this time. It was purely informational. We also received a legislative update um, about some bills that have been dropped in the state legislature that may affect um, the work that we do here going forward, because of course, all of our policies have to align with state law and regulation. We discussed several Strauss Esme policy. Oops, I skipped middle school redistricting. We updated on middle school redistricting. There's an implementation committee that is meeting. Um, I alluded to it in the CNI conversation because representatives from all the middle schools as well as the administration staff are meeting to discuss um, how it will look next year when it'll be a little bit different having three districted middle schools rather than two districted and one magnet school that was done by a different process and they are sharing best practices across the three middle schools to replicate programs that have been successful so that all the students in the district can have access to those programs so I think that's really positive um, there was a lot of 
work that was done when the new middle level schedule was implemented this year to standardize things across the middle schools. And I anticipate that will continue going forward. Um, we also had discussion of Strauss as my policies, which are policies that come down to us to align with things that are being done at the state level. Um, several of them were for discussion only. A few more of them were action was not required by us. They were reviewed by um, the administration. They had to do with security. And then as I spoke about in CNI, we also talked about the abolishment of the road forward COVID policies and the school employee vaccination. Ms. Wethington, how did I do? Is that most of it? <laughs> Thank you for your support as I was pinch hitting tonight. Do any other PNL members have anything they'd like to add or any comments? I must not have done so badly. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you for pinch hitting on that one. And we will go now to Dr. Rood um, to hear the exciting strategic planning committee updates and uh, yeah, updates from the meeting. Um, all right, so we're in our um, second uh, strategic planning committee meeting of the year. Um, and we started off the meeting just with a brief update on the um, sustainability committee, which had its first meeting, um, which was um, so there's about 15 uh, ish uh, people, uh, representatives from uh, there were student reps from high school east and west. There were um, uh, faculty representatives from east, west, Rosa, Sharp. Um, there's a, a local community member who's part of uh, Sustainable South Jersey. Um, a Spanish teacher who's uh, interested in the grant writing aspect. I um, uh, think I captured all of the all of the places where we were drawing our uh, intellectual uh, <laughs> capacity from. Um, I anticipate that that may expand a bit in the in the future. Um, the initial the initial meeting of the committee, um, of course, is part of the district goals of uh, starting a sustainability committee um, that is now rolling. Um, the next, so the 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 initial mission or, <laughs> uh, job of the committee is to put together a, a mission statement for the committee. Um, so that will be the, that work has uh, started and will be the subject of the next sustainability committee meeting, which I believe is tomorrow. Um, so things are rolling on that, and hopefully the the board at large will be getting some feedback from the sustainability committee um, sometime in March or maybe at the beginning of April um, as they present uh, to us our uh, or give us the that mission statement so that we can look that over and um, and approve that, and then hopefully and then that committee should move forward with a plan for the district. Um, so that'll be a lot of uh, interest and conversations along the way. Um, we're already off to, a, I think, a great start. There was a lot of ideas at the table already um, uh, from renewable energy to community gardens to uh, more green options. The students were pretty fixated on uh, green options for lunch. Um, uh, uh, education in the classrooms. Um, there's already um, an important thing that to, to know is that there's already a lot of awesome stuff happening in the district and one of the I think one of the goals of the committee will be to kind of tie into all of the all of the infrastructure that's already there and kind of give it an additional uh, voice and platform. Um, so that's a really exciting start. Uh, and I think it'll be as we, we'll hear. So it's limited info now because we're just it's just getting rolling, but I'm sure we'll have um, lots of nice things to hear from that committee in the months uh, 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 for going forward. Uh, so it's just a brief update. Uh, then the next thing we did was uh, we listened to a um, presentation by Lori Deach, the um, the uh, head of the uh, Fair Funding Committee. Um, so Fair Funding Committee was started around 2017. Is that correct 2017 2016 um and, and it was 2015 it was born out of uh public uh board and administrative interest in making sure that cherry hill got uh the amount of funding that was a lot allotted to them through state formulas and and whatnot because the the district was pretty grossly underfunded 
um, according to what the state said we should get in their in their legislation. So that committee worked hard over the last several years to uh, build support from the community and to reach out to our legislators and to apply pressure to get them to fully fund um, the district according to the formula. And um, some of the, the good news that they were able to present at the at the meeting committee meeting is that last year was the first year that Cherry Hill received the full funding based on the the legislative formula. Um, so that was excellent news to hear. Um, but both uh, uh, the the head of the committee, Lori Deach, and the other and board members and admin admin talked about how uh, it's great that we reached fair funding, but that was a fair funding calculation from like 2008. And so while it is while we were are quote unquote fully funded, that funding still is remarkably low compared to other districts in the state. We're still getting um, sometimes less than, you know, less than a third or a quarter of what some other districts are getting. So one of the big questions that came out in that in the meeting was, well, with fair funding having having reached their goal of getting to that top number, what's their purpose now? What do they do now? And um, we um, and we talked about how there's definitely a role going forward for the fair funding committee and the board, at least within the strategic planning committee. We would like to kind of interface with them a bit more, getting feedback from them and hearing and speaking to them. Um, because going forward, we feel like the mission really needs to be, um, uh, I think we talked about three, sorry, three main things. We talked about maintaining funding at the, at the level, at, at a minimum, maintaining funding at the level that it, it is now with the full, with the full funding Two, recognizing that, well, the, maybe the formula or the implementation of whatever is not great and we need, and things need to be updated or changed at the state level. And we need to advocate for that so that our district can be better funded <laughs> than, um, than it is now um, and reach a, you know, kind of a better uh, funding rate compared to other districts. Um, so that, and then the third thing um, we talked about was the, the fact that the state and, you know, a lot of people probably remember this from the bond talks, the state gives like a 40% um, coverage rate for debt servicing. In other words, the state will give you money if you incur debt uh, in uh, carrying out projects to, to benefit the district. Um, but when it comes to new construction, the rate is much worse. Um, there's very low, I don't remember offhand what the percentage rate is for new projects, but it's not zero. zero. Okay. Do you want to jump in, Lynn? New construction is funded at $143 per square foot, but it typically costs $350 or so dollars per square foot. Okay. So yeah, so, so much a much lower percentage rate. And and it doesn't, uh, you know, so that to a district like ours serve that that creates a problem um, in that, like, you know, we have a lot of of buildings that we need to update. And that's great. But one of the things that we have been talking about, and this comes up, this looms very large when we start talking about preschool expansion, is that, you know, the number of buildings, the amount of space we have is not currently capable of handling that expansion. Um, and so new you know new construction is one avenue that may be a necessity in the future. And the fact that the state's not funding that well at all is a real problem. And that's something that the Fair Funding Committee feels like it could also um, work on talking with, uh, to legislators about. Um, so those, those were the three main things that we talked about as a new path for the Fair Funding Committee. Um, and it was a really nice conversation, a lot of uh, board and admin interaction, um, and we look forward to more advocacy for our district um, from members of the community. Um, one more thing before I open it up to questions. Um, I think today was Fair Funding's, you know, tweet to your legislators day or something. So. Uh, the announcement of 
funding for districts is coming up, I believe, at the very beginning of March after the state address. And so if community community members want to get out there and, and tweet their legislators and say, hey, give Cherry, give Cherry Hill its due, make sure that we're fully funded again, that that would be greatly appreciated. Um, with that said, um, that's the report out. And if there are any comments from other committee members or questions, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, touching back on the sustainability discussion, one of the things that I, I thought was most um, was was really exciting was um, aside from the top level ideas that are coming out of the committee already, the fact that there are already um, so it looks like some great synergies with um, with existing curriculum at, at at all levels and and a number of opportunities uh, perhaps for um, for learning beyond the classroom as well with regard to some of these sustainability projects. And we have other partners that I think we're going to be able to explore um, opportunities for um, with our students. Uh, so I thought that was just an, a nice practical way that we can um, bring some of this into the classroom and then from the classroom out for our students as well. So it was really, it was, it was good to know. Absolutely. Um, anything else? Any other comments, questions? just um, want to thank you for um, really reviving this committee and giving it kind of new life, which is great to see. Um, and specifically, just acknowledge, I think, how hard, how significant the institutional knowledge is with a fair funding conversation, even though it's not even that many years ago that it started. But I think there's been there's always so much change in people who are involved in their board. And, um, you know, it's a lot to, to understand and unpack the, a lot of details. So, um, you know, the, the impact of, you know, since 20, 2008, losing, you know, over $200 million of funding that many other schools got their funding and more it's, uh, the impact is far and wide is felt far and wide, both, you know, in our buildings, which we know, um, and, uh, you know, I think in some of the decisions that have had to be made about uh, making sure our kids get what they need educationally, um, but it's definitely been an impact. So um, thank you for doing that. And happy to say, at least we're getting our 113 million back from, from you know, from debt servicing. So that's the flip side of, of that. But anyway, appreciate your taking the lead on that and continuing the the, the dialogue from a board perspective. So. Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to foster a lot more uh, conversations and strategic planning about different issues like that. It's been it's been um, enlightening and a lot of fun. Um, yep, Ms. Winters. So um, I just wanted to say that a real time example of the work you're doing is that um, Ms. Dana Pilla, who was on your sustainability committee, um, reached out to the girl and boy scout troops that exist at Russell Knight Elementary School. So in my other full time volunteer job that I do for fun as a girl scout leader. I'm going to be in a meeting tomorrow about um, the community garden grant that ARC got and working on that community garden um, as she pulls in people who are affiliated with that school. So it's a great example of connecting beyond the classroom for the scouts that are there who are going to help plant the seedlings and then cultivate the garden this summer. So that's really neat. And also just to say, I know it's not going to fund everything in the universe, but the ROD grants that are available, you can use them for preschool new construction. So I don't know if we're going to be able to build a giant preschool the size of Cherry Hill West, I think, is how big we would need a preschool um, with the ROD grants. But it is one avenue where you could use state money to fund new construction. So that's kind of floating out there. Awesome. Anyone else? Looks like we're good to move on. Okay, thanks. And now we'll move on to our special action agenda. And we go back to Mrs. Winters. And could you kindly move the CNI agenda? Sure. The superintendent recommends, and I move the following 17.1 approval of attendance at conference and workshops for the 2022 23 school year. Are there any questions? Ms. Gallagher. Um, so, the, as I was looking at, um, these conferences, something like came to mind was that a lot of these fall on school days. And, um, you know, something I was considering is like, 
should we also be considering the cost of substitute teachers to take the place of these teachers when they're out on conferences? Because that is a cost that we have to consider when approving. Um, and, you know, some could be more than a day or, you know, or more than just one day. Um, and then another question I had was, how does the district determine, like, who goes to conferences and what conferences? And um, is there like a kind of like an ROI that the district looks to consider when pushing these conferences? I do not have the answers to any of those questions at my fingertips, unfortunately. Um, is there anyone in the administration who can help me out? Thank you, Dr. Mahan. You're welcome. Just in looking at the list, um, some of them that I can speak to are for, some of them are administrators who are traveling. I can tell you if an administrator is out of the building, another administrator, including myself, Dr. Morton, one of the curriculum supervisors, we do try to go to the buildings to cover to make sure that the building is not left without a principal. All of the elementary schools also have what is called a teacher in charge who is paid a stipend to cover the building in the principal's absence. Some of the other sessions that you see on here are specifically for teachers who teach in our specialized programs. And we have to provide some professional development that unfortunately does not occur outside of the school day. So um, teachers can ask to participate in professional development. A lot of times they are directed or um, we determine what professional development they will participate in. There is some mandatory professional development as designated by the New Jersey Department of Education. So it's a variety of ways in which individuals participate in conferences and conventions. Um, we are very mindful of the lack of substitutes that we currently have in the district. So um, this list is actually relatively small in comparison to others we've had. Um, the other one that's on here is for our for person in our facilities department. So again, there are certain um, conferences that we have to go to to maintain our certifications, to maintain um, some credentials, and to make sure that we are abreast of current research in the professional field, in our facilities fields, et cetera. Any other questions? Do I have a second? Ms. Elmore Stratton. Ms. Sugars, can you call the vote? Hey, board members, you may cast your votes. We have uh, one no vote from Ms. Gallagher. The rest uh, of the board voted yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. And we'll move on to um, business and facilities. Mr. Mayor, uh, could you please move the BNF agenda? I could. Um, the superintendent recommends, and I move the following 18.1 approval of bill lists. 18.2, resolution authorizing the utilization of project labor agreements for bond referendum projects undertaken by the district in excess of $5 million. 18.3, resolution approving the transfer of funds to allow for funding of construction project, specifically the Malberg Early Childhood Center playground upgrades. And 18.4, resolution for the award of bids. Are there do I have a second? Dr. Rood, are there any questions? Ms. Gallagher. Um, so <laughs> I know I'm new to this. The cost of the new playground seems high. Is that a standard cost for a playground? I, I haven't purchased yeah. Playgrounds on my house. So I'm, I'm going to leave. I mean, okay. I have, but not this guy. And so I'm going to, so if Ms. Sugars or anyone else can give some comparisons, that would be helpful. So the cost of equipment is always high with playgrounds. Yeah. Um, and also, as you see, the uh, smooth surface material that goes underneath of it is, is very expensive. However, that does um, provide for a more safe uh, surface than the mulch that we currently have. It also means that we don't have to clean out the mulch every year, replace the mulch every year. So there is some savings on that end as well. Um, this The bid award is actually um, a little bit more than just the playground right. area. Um, 
Oh, okay. So there is some ramping. Um, if you're facing Malberg, uh, the front hallway there, um, if you come out of that building has steps currently. Mm -hmm. So we're going to add a ramp there so that, um, you know, we have better egress. Mm -hmm. We're also creating sidewalks that will wind around the building back to the playground. Mm -hmm. So it's not just prepping the playground area. It's also uh, adding some additional concrete work, some additional ramping and some of those kinds of things. Okay. We had estimated 600,000 for yeah. the project. Um, we also had some grant funding um, that we're applying from IDEA funds towards the project. So we came up a little bit short, which often happens. We're typically putting these estimates together right this time of year as we're doing the budget. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes by the time we actually get the projects bid, things change. And, you know, sometimes things are more expensive than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, um, we're able to move some funding around within the capital projects fund with, from uh, projects that are completed. So it's no additional funding going towards the project. It's just kind of doing budget transfers amongst projects to cover the costs. Right. And then just one more question, because I, I don't have the information in front of me, but um, I think the transfers is for about 80,000, but the deficit is about 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we just put some extra in, in the event that there's a change order we didn't anticipate, or there's some additional costs so that we don't have to come back to the board and say, now we need to do another transfer that would hold up the progress of the um, project. Mm -hmm. If we don't use those funds, we can move them elsewhere at, at a later date. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Stern. Um, just sometimes I feel like the, the vault of information from having been here for a full two years, which doesn't seem like it's seems doesn't seem like very long, but um just to kind of add a little bit um from a board member perspective on the Malberg playground. So that project um is um and uh, let me one piece, Mrs. Sugar, is just if I could, if you could um, validate this. So whenever we do a renovation, we have to bring everything up to code. Is that correct when we do renovations? Um, and that would include making um, ADA accessible. And I should probably look at Mr. Green for that too. Um, so um, the getting rid of mulch, which like my, the playground at the elementary school my kids uh, went to has mulch, um, which is not ADA accessible. Um, so um, this is a really important piece of ensuring that as we renovate our playgrounds, that they're all accessible for our students. And we, you know, and that's a piece of, um, you know, something that this board um, had had a lot of discussion about, had a lot of comment on, um, besides the fact that obviously we're required to do that. We also, it's just really important that we do that. So um, I think between um you know, I think it's important to look at, you know, change in costs and increased costs, um, but anyone buying eggs these days will also probably say that a year ago, we might not have known what the cost of eggs would have been. So I think, you know, that's kind of how I, the way I look at this, um, it's important to ask questions and to understand it. And that just, just the piece about the the ADA access is, I think is so critical for the inclusiveness of our, for our students. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, that's not where I'm coming from. <clears throat> where I'm just coming from is, looking at it from a perspective of this is a single playground, right? And so we have 12 other elementary schools that maybe that money could go create, a help build another, you know what I mean? So talking about kind of like doing what's best for the whole, there's just an element where I see it as we could probably still keep the playground within ADA compliance without that $50,000 to me. Do you know what I mean? Like, at least from what I'm getting at, like, at least from what I'm seeing. So that was all my question is, is one, I was just surprised at the cost of a playground. And I mean, and I understand that we're limited by who we can use as contractors, correct, for like jobs like this, just based off of like, right, like, just kind of like working well, anytime uh, publics, we do public works, um, right. prevailing wage, the contractor has to be right. uh, qualified to do the, you know, to perform the work. So there are, it's not, you can't really compare it to work done at your home. Oh, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, the other thing I wanted to say um, is that there is money in the bond referendum to do all the other playgrounds. So we will be addressing other playgrounds moving forward.
more questions? Seeing none, Ms. Sugars, would you please open the voting? Hey, the board, uh, board members may cast their votes. If you uh, need to abstain or vote no, please let me know. I'll mark it. I, I need to abstain from 18.1. I'm going to vote no on 18.3. Okay, other than the exceptions noted, we have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, thank you. And we will move on to um, human resources. Um, uh, Mrs. Stratton, can you please move the HR agenda? Superintendent recommends, and I move the following, 19.1, termination of employment certificated, 19.2, termination of employment non-certificated, 19.3, appointment certificated, 19.4, appointments non-certificated, 19.5, assignment salary change non-certificated, 19.6, other compensation certificated. Do I have a second? Mr. Mayor, any questions? Others, could we please open the vote? The online voting is open. If you have an abstention or no vote, uh, let me know. And we have a unanimous yes vote. Okay. Uh, we move on to policy and legislation. And Ms. Winters, if you would pinch hit on this one again, and please move the PL agenda. Superintendent recommends, and I move the following 20.1 approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, investigation decisions. 20.2 approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, investigation, hearing decisions. And 20.3 approval of waiver of regulation 2340 field trips. Do I have a second? Mr. Greenbaum, any questions? Seeing no questions, Ms. Sugars, can you please open the vote? Hey, the online voting is open. You may cast your votes. If you have an abstention or no vote, please let me know. Stratton. Ms. Sugars, can I please abstain from 20.2? Uh, Mr. Tong? Yes, uh, may I please abstain, abstain from 20.2? Thank you. Other than the exceptions noted, we have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, we move on to strategic planning. Dr. Rood, I believe there are no items to be moved tonight yet, but we're getting there. So one day you're going to have this huge agenda. And we're going to move all, all these items. So, okay, very good. All right, um, and now we move on to in record time, but don't get your hopes up because... The meeting's not over yet. Uh, new business. Um, is there any new business to discuss this evening? I don't have any new business, but I did really want to acknowledge many of us have some beautifully made um, Valentine's um, decor cards with names, very sweet, from our students at the Malberg Early Childhood Center. So just want to um, shout out to those students and um, those teachers and the staff in the building for to please pass along our thank you for um, uh, more wall decorations for my house, which I, I no longer have since I have teenagers who barely will talk to me, let alone <laughs> get me a card or draw a card or what have you. So, okay. Uh, my personal commentary. Uh, let's move on to old business. Is there any old business? Okay. Um, we now get to move on to our second public comment. So um, if you would like to speak, uh, please clearly state your name and municipality. Um, this is a time when you may comment on any item um, and we will um, alternate between speakers here in the room and those who are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes. Uh, to speak, the timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. 
Cherry Hill is a community that values education and educational topics often bring out a passionate response. The Cherry Hill Board of Education supports a school climate in which our diversity is a source of strength and all are included. Respect is foundational in how you treat, how we treat you, how you treat us, and how we treat one another, how we support our administration and our staff in their essential work. Please join us in practicing the utmost respect for all. Okay, and we have a first, first at the podium, um, if you would kindly state um, your name and your municipality. Nick Gaudio, Cherry Hill. Good evening. Over the weekend, I sent an email to Dr. Malash and Rose's principal, Mr. Guy, and followed up with an email to the entire BOE. Uh, my daughter has an individual part in Rose's drama club play, Susical Jr., and the drama club has been rehearsing for the last few months, learning their numbers, songs, and dances, and from what my daughter tells me, all the students have been excited about the play. This past Saturday, they had a mandatory all-day rehearsal starting at 8 a.m. sharp. At 8 a.m., the principal and director ushered the students into the library, where they were made to listen to an hour-long guest lecture by a Rosa parent about how Dr. Seuss was a racist and how his books and the play included symbols of racism, specifically monkeys that were intended to represent Black people. The presentation continued to talk about Dr. Seuss's racist history towards other various non-WASP demographic groups, and by the end of it, many students were left feeling confused and unexcited about the play. Their excitement had been for a play that was written within the last 25 years, adopting various characters and phrases from Dr. Seuss's classic children's books without any intention to include racist innuendos. My problem is with the schools and districts' initial approval of the play in light of this concern about the inherent racism therein. Most importantly, the students voted on which play to perform. The number one play was Legally Blonde with 65 first and second choice votes. Frozen and High School Musical received 13 and 11 votes respectively. Sioux School was the fourth choice with only seven votes. There's no logical explanation for why this play was chosen over the others that had far more votes other than the underlying intention to lecture the students on the racial assumptions about a man who was born 120 years ago, instead of picking a completely benign play with no element that could even be perceived as controversial. After all the students were lectured on this, many were bewildered about why the school would have forced this upon them. Why would they do this to middle school students who wanted to be part of an innocent drama production with their friends and classmates? Why should my daughter at only 12 years old be made to feel that she's part of something that the district believes has sinister undertones and closed-minded innuendos against many of her friends, some of whom are also involved in the play. It's not comfortable to talk about racism, and I agree that its history should not be concealed. However, there are more appropriate times and methods to discuss these issues than 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning with a group of 11 to 14-year-old students who are excited to continue to give lots of their otherwise free time and effort in taking part in something that they have just been taught has a blighted origin. The district should pull Susicle and replace it with an uncontroversial play, directing Rose to extend the production dates accordingly. If no such decision is made, I will not punish my daughter by pulling her from the play, but please be aware that you're toying with the emotions of dozens of young children who have been through the ringer the last few years and potentially endangering their reputations with their friends and society as a whole after being part of something that they are being taught is so controversial. Thank, Thank you. you for your time and consideration. Thank you. And we'll move on to the line. And the first hand that I see on the line is uh, Carolina Bevitt. Good evening, Carolina Bevitt, Cherry Hill. Um, I agree with Mr. Gaudio. Why would the school approve a play but then condemn it as racist? That's strange, but that's not what my main comment is about. I wanted to just thank the BNF committee for discussing the school breakfast options because even though Aramark you know, fits the regulations for what students need to be served. Those breakfast options are sort of setting a precedent for our kids on what is a healthy breakfast. So if they eat donuts or pop tarts, even if they're labeled healthy by Aramark, when they go off and make their own breakfast choices later in life, they aren't necessarily choosing the healthy donuts, which I don't even know if that exists if they do it, I'm contacting Aramark to, to find those healthy donuts, but um, you know, it sets the tone that a donut is a good breakfast. So they're not always gonna have like a healthy donut option for them. So I'd love to see more cereal, um, so good option, quick and easy. So thank you for addressing that and maybe even extend it into the lunch options. Cause also I've seen some 
parents and kids complain. And that's kind of how stigmas get created that the, the food, you know, is labeled as gross or not good enough. And then the parents who can pack do and, and the kids who can pack their own lunch, bring it. And then the kids who can't are left eating the lunch that is labeled as gross or, or not good. So thanks for discussing that. That's it. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. If there's anybody who'd like to speak, please approach the podium. Okay, if you could please say your name and you, your municipality. Good evening, Dave Kuzmanich, Cherry Hill. Um, I'd like to start off uh, by saying good evening. And my son is in the middle school, Beck. I just had a meeting with the vice principal and guidance counselor today. My son has been harassed for the past four months on the school bus on the ride home almost on a weekly basis. A couple of students have HIB forms against them. From what I understand, conversations have been had with the parents. The kids turn out to be good for a couple of weeks, and then they go back to the regular old bullying and, and, and intimidation and harassment. Um, one of the young students uh, has definitely said some sexual content things towards my son, asking about how he identifies also has cursed possessively on the on the bus. I had him videotape on the bus and showed that to the vice principal today. Uh, one of the students has also now twice accosted my son by hitting them and by hitting my son. So I hope your new policies will do something about this because I'm ready to get the police involved and have that child walked out in handcuffs because of the unwanted touching and physical abuse. Thank you. Thank you. And now we go to the line. Um, and I believe this is Dr. Potowitz from the phone number. So the line's yours. My name is Jeff Potowitz and I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, please refer to the, the New Jersey, which is found online, the New Jersey Strategic Plan for Preschool Expansion Phase 1 Foundation. For, from the New Jersey DOE, October 2022. Read how the state wants to limit state funding for new districts that are starting preschools. And that's not on universal preschools. Not that many districts have universal preschools. Note, Camden City School District with approximately 1,000 students receives an additional $31 million in state preschool aid. That's for 1,000 students. We're going to have an estimated 1,700 students eventually. That's at a cost of 30. When you deal $31,000 a, a child, that's an additional $52.7 million plus probably in cost to this district and our community. All right. And we're going to how much state aid will we get for that? We don't know. That's important. What we did find out today is that we may be building a new building using the part of the Rod Grant. All right. To me, why don't you focus? You should focus on the learning of the K through 12 students, including the 20, 25 percent of our students with IEPs and um, 504s. That's important. Focus on them. And then when you're totally successful, why don't you focus on this? Um, something else that was mentioned at one of the other one, one of the other committee meetings. Um, um, uh, okay, it was it was written since the west side of town has an influx of students, the district may need <clears throat> more buildings. It was noted that the state for new construction would be only one hundred and forty three dollars per square foot foot foot, foot which is well below the current. $350 per square foot. My question to the board, does that $350 per square foot include the 25% soft cost, or is the current market value really $440 per square foot? Is it $350, or really total when you include 25% soft cost, $440 per square foot? Notice also, and the report it stated, that um, the Fair Funding Committee said we have $170 million is due, is due to the district from past. That's, we're talking about SFRA. 
So um, please refer to SFRA District Profile, Education Law Center, found online. The difference really isn't 170. It's over $210 million. Note also. Thank you, Dr. Potters. I'm sorry. Um, Your time is up. Thank you for calling in. And feel free to email uh, anything else that you would like us to know that you didn't get a chance to say. Thank you. Okay, we come back to the room. If you would just kindly state your name and your municipality. Good evening. First of all, Harvey Vasquez, Cherry Hill. I want to take this time to express my family's disappointment with the Cherry Hill School District as it relates to special education. For the past 10 months, my family and I have been battling this school district for our son's right to receive basic services that will enable him to have a free and appropriate public education. We have been met with obstacles since the very beginning. And as of today, our son still sits at home waiting for the district to grant him an opportunity to attend kindergarten with his peers. Our son Dylan is a six year old child with autism, feeding disabilities who barely survived the one year battle with chronic lung disease as a NICU patient at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He endured several resuscitation procedures as well as having ventilator support around the clock since he was unable to breathe on his own. All along as parents, we never lost faith that we could fight through this together with the help of the many medical professionals that cared for him during this time. Our son is a clear example on how institutions and advocating parents can work together to achieve a common goal that would benefit those in need. My wife and I have fiercely advocated for our son since birth. Because of our efforts, CHOP has requested we be ambassadors for the annual chronic lung disease convention as a testament on how parents' advocacy can influence treatments of medical institutions. Unfortunately, institutions such as yours many times look at numbers, dollars, and percentages, but forget to include the human element in your decisions. My question to you is why not listen to parents as they advocate for their children with special needs? As an institution, you must understand that basic standardized tests are not the only measurement tool that should be considered when assessing the needs of a disabled child. There is a human element that many times gets lost in these evaluations. These are the areas where parents are most involved with as they interact with their child on a day-to-day basis. However, our concerns have been met with one standard answer. We cannot provide the services you need, or we cannot accommodate your request. This stance taken by the school district leads many families such as ours to accept their faith in getting what they can or going to battle for services that the child rightly deserves and are entitled to. As I'm sure you are aware, these battles cause an undue burden on parents financially and emotionally. The school district stance seems to be one of flight or fight. In other words, take what we offer and if you decide to fight our stance, we'll bring in our lawyers. I ask you again, is this what it takes for my child to attend school just because he has special needs? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go on to the line and uh, Anna Einhorn, you are next. Anna Einhorn, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, I just wanna comment that the voting no on the ADA playground at Malberg is disappointing, particularly to the students. Um, I'd also like to comment after listening tonight that some board members need to realize that there's more than one elementary school in this district and their enthusiasm. Uh, I'd also like to comment about uh, moving special needs or special education children out of Rosa um, because they deserve to stay there through eighth grade. I'm very disappointed that on the Cherry Hill Tomorrow site, there's absolutely nothing that's been done. Um, I'd also like to see the original schematics and drawings and recommendations from Mr. Garrison put back up. Otherwise, am I assuming that I have to make an OPA request in order to follow any kind of bond projects that the community voted on? I'm going to once again express my dismay that moving this BNF meeting should be to 4.30 in the afternoon does a disservice to our community where many members of the public who work have no chance of attending in person. The minutes from these committee meetings aren't put up until at least two months past the committee meeting. Some of you on this board ran on the platform of transparency and it's not transparent when the public can't attend and some of us would like to attend. 
um, please redo your thinking because quite frankly, there's a veil of lack of transparency when members of the public who are interested really can't get there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. If anyone would like to speak, please approach the podium. Okay, if you just kindly say your name and municipality. Okay. Heard me say that multiple times tonight. Hi. Thank you. Uh, Mike Abrascato, class of 98 and father of two kids in elementary school here at uh, Cherry Hill. Um, Sigmund Freud was widely considered the father of psychoanalysts. He is famous for uh, taking a deeper look at almost everything, something that left-leaning liberals do today. The difference is Freud thought on a deeper level that everything meant you wanted to have sex with your mother, while everything liberals, everything to liberals means racism. Um, as we've heard from Mr. Gaudio tonight, uh, Rosa was holding their annual drama club play. Uh, the drama club voted for Legally Blonde. The director slash school decided not to listen to the students in this case. Um, and said that the decision was made for them to, uh, the Susical was going to be the play. Uh, this past weekend, the children were told they had to attend a mandatory practice where they were lectured on the supposed racism of Dr. Seuss. Uh, photos were actually shared on, photo on social media as well. The characters in question here are the Wickersham brothers. According to the Wiki, Wikipedia of Dr. Seuss, the Wickershams are a family of 26 clever little alphabet monkeys from the jungle of Newell who, along with Vlad Vladikov, a vulture-like creature, and Jane, Jane Kangaroo, a kangaroo, of course, um, torment Horton from Horton Hears a Who in this play. No one seems to claim Jane Kangaroo is a misogynistic wet dream or Vlad Vladikov is somehow anti-Semitic, but somehow we, here we are claiming that characters drawn like monkeys are somehow racist. Uh, looking into the character's story, uh, they appear on the Wobulous World of Dr. Seuss show, uh, where they are the comic relief characters uh, that come in a variety of colors, orange, blue, and purple, just to name a few. Uh, most of the media are left-leaning liberals, uh, and they seem to be looking for racism in, every, in everything. Uh, this past Sunday, the media played up the fact that the Super Bowl had starting quarterbacks that were both black on both teams, which, in my opinion, lessens their contributions uh, during, the, during the season, uh, their hard work, and their success. Uh, Cherry Hill Public Schools seem to now be appearing, be doing that with Dr. Seuss characters. Sigmund Freud once said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Just because a character is drawn like a monkey does not mean that there's racial undertones. If you don't believe that or can't get over that fact, maybe the real racist is staring at you in the mirror. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then we go back to the line. And I do not see any hands raised uh, on the line. So we come back to the room, and if there's anyone who would like to speak in the room, um, please feel free to approach the podium. Okay. Yeah. I think you know what to do. Yes. Uh, Yoni, are still Cherry Hill. Um, thanks. Well, I just wanna say as PTA president at Malberg, we are super excited for this playground. Um, many, many, many years in the going. Um, it's really disappointing for a school that serves predominantly students with atypical and a lot of mobility challenges. Having a playground where all the children can play on it will be a massive change and really, it'll be really fun to go and open that up this summer um, and celebrate it. Um, so thank you for that continued effort. Um, we have a lot of transitions coming in the community, especially with Rosa transitioning to its next phase. Um, with the first phase being the last 23 years, it'd be really nice to honor the staff that put that building together 20, almost 25 years ago to today. Uh, they went through a lot of professional development. There's a lot of them that have stuck in those positions, which is even more impressive with more people leaving the teaching profession and after the last couple of years. If we get together right to honor, I think there's about 15 at most who have been there since day one. Uh, when I was part of the class that opened that building two weeks after the start of the school year, um, don't uh, pray for no hurricanes during bond construction. That's all I'm saying right now. Um, still very paranoid from what took place there. It was not fun in 1990 and 2000 here. Um, and then also just wanted to acknowledge Lori Dietrich is going to be stepping down for fair funding at the end of the year. She has been a juggernaut for this for many years at the board and the administration could honor her. Um, her old, youngest is graduating from the district. Um, and I think it's really nice. As I always seem to come up here and say, it's really nice to celebrate people. Um, and I think we need to do more of that in our community. So I think she'd be someone who to put forward um, to celebrate um, coming before the end of the school year just to say thank you. Thanks. Thank you. 
Now we go to the line and uh, Panina Mintz is on the line next. Hi, Panina Mintz, Dr. Panina Mintz, Cherry Hill. Uh, I'd like to recommend uh, a book for the Board of Education and to administrators of Cherry Hill. The book's name is Agency. Uh, the author is Ian Rowe. Uh, it talks about the four-point plan, which is for children to overcome the victimhood narrative and discover their pathway to power. I'd like to read to you from page 27, uh, bottom paragraph, to give you an example uh, and maybe to put you on a different tra trajectory for the Cherry Hill school system. Um, this is now a reading from uh, the book. Uh, it's chapter 2, page 27. There are many problems with today's blame the system narrative of individual parlance powerlessness. Uh, one is the power to give to others to somehow rescue black Americans. Glenn Lowry, a Brown University economist, made this point at a 2019 Manhattan Institute event titled Barriers to Black Progress, Structural, Cultural, or Both. Lowry, Lowry was asked where, uh, whether we need to tackle white people's supremacist attitudes before black people address the factors within their control. Factors like high levels of single parenthood that create a greater likelihood of child poverty. Lowry's response could not have been clearer or a better explanation for the need, of the need for agency. You just made white people the ones who we say are the implacable, racist, indifferent, don't care oppressors into the sole agents of your own delivery. Really? Uh, continuing on the top of page 28. Uh, but there are other and perhaps larger okay, um, problems. Tina Mintz, if you could uh, kindly stop our board solicitor uh, directing us to... The system vision of powerless narrative. Okay. One is that it does not. Please stop the public comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And we will move on. If there's any other public comment in the room, the podium. Okay. Name a municipality, please. Alana Yaris, Cherry Hill. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to Diana. I don't know her last name, the bus driver for my son who attends Malberg Early Childhood Center. Um, she was out sick last week and she made such an impression on him that he was super nervous to get on the bus last week because he did not recognize the bus driver. Um, and that's a testament to Malberg and the bus driver and the aides on the bus that even though he had a rocky start to his morning and we warned his teacher about it, that he still had a great day and a great week at school. Um, and we were glad and happy to see her back this week. Um, and he was excited to see her as well. And he doesn't give smiles to a lot of people. And he was very excited to see her and gave her a smile. So I just wanted to say thank you to the district. Thank you to Malberg ECC. Thank you to his teacher and the bus driver and the aide on the bus. Because um, without them, I don't know if my son would be successful in school this year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Looking on the line, no hands. Looking in the room. And we're going to close public comment and we will move on to our superintendent's comments. So, Dr. Malash. Thank you, Ms. Stern. Uh, just a few things to follow up. I uh, agree. And thank you to Ms. Edwards, who's the principal at the Early Childhood Center, and the staff who put the cards together and sent them over for the board. Uh, always very appreciative, um, like the celebrate uh, with the children. Um, so let's see. Uh, Cheryl, tomorrow, the information on the website should be ready, I believe, end of this week. Does that sound right? I'm getting the nod yes from the tech guys. Uh, so that information should be linked on our website this week. Uh, Mr. Vasquez, thank you for coming out and speaking. I know that you've been working with Ms. Mallory uh, and the team. I hope that there has been successful progress. Uh, Mr. Kuzmanich, I'll reach out to Ms. Metzger um, and make sure that she is aware. I'll also speak with uh, Dr. Morton so that he can follow up and make sure that um, they can pull the stuff to see what's in, in the system and see what's there. And they will follow up with folks on the bus as well. Uh, Mr. Mr. Gaudio, uh, I encourage you to 
spend some time with Mr. Guy. Uh, I know that you two, you wrote, he wrote back, and he contacted the board uh, as well. Uh, I encourage you to have a conversation um, with him um, as a follow up. Uh, I want to thank the students who got up and spoke tonight. Uh, I'm always appreciative for students being willing to take the opportunity to get up and speak. Not certainly not always the easiest thing to do uh, in a public meeting, but I'm grateful that they got up uh, and we have heard their message and the information that they shared. Oh, uh, Ms. Stearns reminded me that the minutes from the committee meetings are also posted online uh, on the district website. If you look under the, the Board of Education tab, uh, there's a section in there about committees and you can find the committee minutes that are on there. Thank you, good reminder. Thank you for your comments, Dr. Malash. And um, in record time, I think we are at the end of our meeting. So I'm going to ask for um, someone would, um, I will make a motion to adjourn the meeting. If I could please have a second. Okay, Dr. Rude is highly seconding that. And all in favor, say aye. Thank you. Okay, okay. motion carries, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>